All right, everybody, and this is Inside Bodybuilding. This is episode number four. I'm your host, Matt Meinrod, and with me in the co-pilot seat is Taylor Normando. Taylor, we have a big, big show for April. We are we're back. starting off. We're starting off with an industry superstar. He is a IFBB Pro competitor, but he's also one of the biggest names and most respected coaches in all of bodybuilding. We have Factory Mubrak with us this afternoon, though. Thank you, thank you, man. I, I, I appreciate that uh, the introduction, man. Um, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Yeah, we well, we like to uh, hype up our guests so they feel nice and cozy before we <laughs> before we tear them down in the Thunderdome that is the inside bodybuilding. Oh um, no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we that's it. We we soften you up so we can really nail you with some tough ones. Um, All right, you got me ready for it though. I know. I just be prepared. Uh, no holds barred. <laughs> here um before all the stuff about you know obviously how you work with your clients because i think you're I, I feel like it, just in 2015 you're more known for your coaching than you are your competitive career um yep. and that's just obviously how things evolve and whatnot um but we just went through so we're gonna get through you know we're gonna go through all you, all that stuff so people can pick your brain through the interview but let's talk about the arnold classic that just was uh, who did you have in the show who did you work with in the show um, I had in the 212, I had, uh, Aaron Clark and I had, uh, Marco Rivera and then in bikini, I had Nicole Anki in the pro division. All right. So let's, um, since 95% of the show obviously has been, so let's, um, let's talk about Aaron Clark. I had him as hopefully, you know, he's been on the show before and he's a friend of the show. Um, sponsored is his sponsor is one of our, you know, our sponsors, Blackstone Labs, so he's kind of like part of the group with us. I was pulling him for him to, you know, take the show. Obviously, he had some some tall, uh, some some big competitors before him standing in his way. He didn't look his best. What what would you say went wrong with him coming in fourth instead of pushing for that top spot? Well, I mean, to to be honest, you know, and I, and I even told Ivan this, I, I, the whole prep was like there was something missing. Um, I couldn't, you know, I, I'm, I'm an honest, I'm an honest, just person overall, and I'm just an honest coach. Um, there was just something missing the whole entire prep, you know. We, you know, we were making changes, and he was looking better. Um, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like, even like that for the Olympia prep, that people thought he was off at the Olympia. I didn't think he was that far off in the Olympia. But um, this prep just didn't go as perfect as, 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 we, uh, as we hoped for. Um, you know, there's a, there was a lot of deciding factors. You know, he moved down to Florida. Um, you know, he was working a full-time job with Blackstone as a sales rep. Um, you know, Blackstone has been, Aaron and PJ have been amazing to him, for him. Um, you know, he's part of the team there, and it's, and it's great because he has, you know, he has the needed, um, I guess, you know, the support around him that, that he needed to, to take it to the next level. Um, but I don't, it just, it just, honestly, it just, you know, I don't, I, I can't, I can't pinpoint it. I can't say it was this, it was that. I can't say it was my fault. I can't say it was his fault. Um, you know, as a coach, you always have to take the blame, um, Unfortunately, or fortunately, but um, I mean, it just we, I just can't pinpoint it what what it was to be honest with you. Hey, I was well, he gonna... actually was telling me that um, that he was going in, you know, like hypo or hippo. I don't know how you pronounce it on on stage where he was like low blood sugar and kind of feeling like he was going to pass out. Um, was that related yeah, to his um, carb up or what, what was going on with that? Because he just admitted um, that on my forum. Yeah, we've had we've had a lot of like we've tried a lot of different things um, as far as like him being on stage. Aaron like Aaron has to he he flattens out really fast, you know. So he we have to keep him full. For example, at the New York Pro, you know, when when he did the prejudging, it was pretty close between him and Guy, you know. Um, but but Aaron was really flat. After prejudging at the New York Pro, I mean, we filled him up with so much stuff, man. It was like cookies, cake. I mean, I can't even tell you because then people are going to start trying they're going to be out of shape on stage from now on. You know, so that's the type of, you know, that's the type of food that he needs to eat, like that junk food that's shit-loading him most. Um, I'm, I'm totally against that. I, you know, I'm, I'm more of an old-school mentality. I'd rather have the person come in a little drier, you know, just, you know, even if it's a little bit flatter, but more shredded. And uh, it just, we couldn't, it wasn't even like filling him up. We just couldn't pull that last amount of water from him. You know, 
And even I, last year at the Arnold, when we showed up at the Arnold last year, you know, he had he had a lot of problems getting from where he used to live to, to Ohio. And he looked horrible when we got that Wednesday night. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm talking about horrible. Like, I looked at him and I was like, oh, shit. You know, and then little by little, Friday and Thursday, I had him sleep. He was like, well, well I'm, you know, what am I going to do? I'm like, just sleep, just eat, you know, just still, still, still getting a little bit better. And by Friday, he was looking really good. Um, this Wednesday, when we got there, you know, he was looking okay. He just didn't, he didn't progress from Wednesday to, to Friday much, you know. In fact, was there a certain point in the prep where you, you realized you might not be, you know, coasting in at his best, or did you sort of still have hope, or was it kind of uh, just not right from the beginning, or it was like three weeks out, four weeks out? Was there a certain point you kind of clued in? No, I mean, like, like I said, you know, I mean, that's, that's a good question. What I said was, like, last year when we got to the Arnold, uh, last year everything was perfect going into Arnold, and then with the traveling problems that he had Wednesday, you know, two days before the show, he looked horrible. So I, it, it's never enough. It, I can't lose hope in, in a person like Aaron because he could change his body so quickly that like he did last year from Wednesday to Thursday. This year, like, you know, it just the whole prep wasn't like it wasn't in advancing the way we wanted to advance, you know. And uh, and when you get on stage with these guys, like you know, like Jose Raymond, Eduardo, you know, Heedy. You know, it, it, these guys, also guys, remember, please, these guys are a lot older, so they have a lot more maturity in their muscle, and they look a lot different, you know, and you, even though Aaron is built a certain way, and he's, and he's genetically blessed by God, you know, he still has to show out a little bit more, so when he's a little bit off and these guys are on, it makes a big difference. Though, did you see it the way I saw Because I thought Jose was like a runaway champion, and everybody else was kind of going for second, third, and fourth, and fifth. Is that how you saw it, too, or was it closer? No, I agree. Who who'd you have in second? Uh, I liked Hide, but, you know, that's just, I didn't, you know, I I was surprised at uh, Eduardo because I thought his arm, arm just looked really, really bad. The, going to the show, I thought Charles Dixon was going to do better than he did. But, um, yeah, I had Hida Tata right there in second. What'd you think, Taylor? Um, I think I would have had Eduardo in second, but he, he wasn't really his best. Uh, he wasn't nearly as good, I thought, as the Olympia. He's a little flatter, and his structure kind of yeah. gets a little more... Um, Eduardo has a if when he's on and he's full, I think his structure stands out as being different. But when he's a little flatter, he looks a, a little strange in some shots. And the arm, I mean, the arm is invisible in every shot. But I probably would have had Eduardo second. But it's really hard to argue. Yeah, yeah I, I really I, I agree with what Taylor just been saying. Yeah. Now, what about the uh, open class? Because that was like the really controversial class. Um, a lot of people said Cedric. A lot of people like Compton, even though Compton wasn't at his all time best or whatever whatever that means to a few shows, but um, did you have uh, Branch and, and Dexter one, two, like we saw one and two or two and one, uh, or how'd you see it? I think uh, Justin, Justin looked really good all over, except from the bottom of his chest to the top of his waist. He was holding, he was just holding a, a very strange film of water there, you know, so his, his eyes were completely blurred, but it was, you know, it was really like, it was really strange because, I mean, the rest of his body was completely peeled. He was bigger. He was harder everywhere, you know. Um, and, and that's what caused, I think that's what caused him to show, to be honest with you, because if he would have came in with a, with a really crisp midsection, and, and it wasn't like his labs were not there. They were there. But the film of water was just like, it was almost like painted on. It was kind of weird. Um, I would have probably had Justin one in the show if he would have been, you know, crisp in, in the ab area. Um it was. I said like I've never seen anything like it. It was like really weird. Um, let me hold up before you go. On, before you go on and continue, let me let me stop you there because for throughout the nineties, throughout early two thousands, it was always perceived. It was like the catchphrase: "If shows are won from the back." Right. Justin looked great from the back. So is that kind of like a misnomer? Like shows really aren't won from the back, or they they are as long as you have great abs. Like it. You know what I mean? It sounds a little fishy when. If you, the consensus was if you don't have any folds in your lower back and if your glutes are in and if you have you know, all the you're dialed into an upper back and all of a sudden that, that kind of got washed to have great abs and I agree you didn't have great abs but is that where did that thinking go like where did what, what happened to those shows being one from the back. No, no, I agree. I, I mean, I, I should. That's, that's how I used to watch shows from the back. You know, I didn't have a, I didn't have a great, uh, 
I didn't have a great chance, and you know, my apps weren't. I just didn't have great app development. Period. I used to come in shredded, but um, no, I, I mean, I, I still agree to show the one from the back because you know, a lot of people look good from the front. Um, but it wasn't like it wasn't that like he didn't have apps. It just he had like a film of water. You know, it was like it was just like a, like I'm telling you, it was like you just painted on like with a paintbrush right over his abs. You know, and his abs were completely blurred. So it, it was it was really. I mean, as soon as it came out, I was like, what the fuck? You know. I was sitting with Dennis James, and Dennis James was like, dude, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know. I've never seen Justin like that. Um, so it could have been anything, but, you know, I, I see, I kind of like, I mean, it was probably something that he was carving up on, um, some type of food that just didn't sit well with him and, you know, whatever. And however he was pulling water, you know, he was pulling water from the rest of his body, but whatever that food was, um, dude, it could have been, it could have been yams, it could have been dry oats. You know, I mean, I, I've worked with Justin in the past, so in a few shows, so I, I mean, I kind of know how his body works, um, but it could have been anything, you know, but I think if Justin would have, if, if, if his abs had just been dry, it was, not, not, not that he didn't have them, he just needed to be dry, he would have took the show. Um, as far as the winner, um, I think Dexter deserved it. You know, he, he wasn't his all-time best, but he, but he was just good enough to win that show. Um, Branch was shredded. <laughs> He was just freaking peeled, man. He looked inhuman. But, you know, Branch has, you know, Branch has the structural um, indifferences, um, and that's why he came in second. Um, third, Compton. Cedric, I think Cedric still needs to get harder. You know, Cedric has a great body, great physique, great lines, um, but he still needs to come in harder. What do you, you say harder, and this is where really, it, like, as a fan of the sport, just like, because I'm not like a purist in my opinions on the sport, like I'm not the type who says the seventies were the golden age. I still prefer the nineties or today's look better. Um, yeah, you know what I mean? Like that look was okay, but Arnold would have got destroyed against the guys of the night. He's I look at what is bodybuilding, right? And, and body trick. It's, it's big. I mean, he's still a massive guy, but he's got great lines and great shape and sure. It may not be as hard as branch, but branch doesn't look like even a, a fraction of how good Cedric looks just as far as his aesthetics go. Why, why do you think, I mean, pretend you're a judge for a minute. Why, why do they reward branches freakiness, but kind of shove aside how great and beautiful Cedric's physique is? Why can't they judge them equally? You sound like Arnold right after the, 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 <laughs> the, the show. Did you see the video? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I want to ask you yeah, about I mean, that later, too. Oh, I know, man. <laughs> I'm going to have to take my political <laughs> correct stance on that one. But, uh, I, right, I, so I don't blame you at all. I don't blame you at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's, let, let's go through this question first. Um, no, I agree. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it's a subjective sport. Um, you know, it's, it's, there is no objective way of winning the sport. You know, I can't knock you out. I can't pin you. I can't shoot a three-point over your head. You know, I can't. There's, there's no way of obje objectively winning, you know, the, the, the show. So, you know, you, you come with the judges, and the judges have to appoint the winner of how they feel meets the best criteria. Um, you know, and, and part of the criteria, you know, is, is symmetry, muscularity, you know, conditioning, you know, those, those are all criteria that they have to put, it, put in and, and, and decide a winner. Um, I mean, from my point of view, you know, and I, I've been doing this for a long time. I've, 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 been, I've been around the sport for a long, long time. I mean, I've, I've been training for 25 years, but I've been around the sport since I was like eight, nine years old with my cousins and stuff like that. Um, I, I had, when Branch came out, I was just in awe. I mean, I, when he came out, I was just, I was just, he just looks ridiculous. So they, you know, to, to award Branch second place, I, I, I personally could understand because I saw what he looked like, you know, as a bodybuilder myself, you know, I was more of a symmetrical bodybuilder, good conditioning. Um, when I was young, I had a good physique, you know, um, <laughs> But, uh, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, Cedric just needs to be harder. He needs to be drier. He needs to be harder. You know, it's also, you know, guys, you, have to, you also have to understand one thing. You know, when people expect something out of you and you don't reach it, you know, every time you show up and you don't reach it, it's like, well, it's not there, it's not there, it's not there. You know, and Cedric has always been told that he needs to get harder and he needs to get drier. So if he doesn't bring it into the show that has Dexter, that has Branch, that has, you know, young 
Justin Compton, who I say is going to be the next Prince Olympia. You know, it, it, it's hard for him to move up. Right. Yeah, do you think they, they kind of put a bit of, even almost sort of penalize him more so just for sort of not getting the message? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, can see I think that. they should just all. I think they should all get together and get into a room, and all the guys that can't nail their conditioning from <laughs> from Compton to Cedric to Big Rami, and just let them do their own show, so we can see like these guys that really don't know how to nail it. I thought and you then we can have... starve them in a room for six, six, three months. <laughs> the great thing about bodybuilding is that you know we're all different. You know, I mean, you know, if Matt got on stage, if Taylor got on stage, if I got on stage, you know, we all look different. So, you know, that's that's the whole thing. And not everybody could reach. You know, that, not everybody could be Mr. Olympia. Not everybody could, you know, get on that on stage. You know, I mean, it, it wasn't. It, I'm not saying that Justin wasn't in condition because I thought, like I said, if, if Justin's midsection was not, you know, didn't have that film of water, I had him as the clear winner. I mean, with his with his shape and his symmetry, and the conditioning inside that he brought to that show was it was just crazy. You I know, agree. It's amazing what he's been able to do. But, yeah, he he lost the show with whatever happened to his abs. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Now you, you don't you know obviously I you know you're entrenched in all aspects of the sport, so you can answer this however you want. Going into the show, there were a lot of people that thought Compton still needed to pay his dues a little bit. Do you think had he actually, let's just pretend he would have had great abs. Do you think he would have still to beat Dexter or Branch? Or do you think they would have, you know, the, who's they, the, the, the powers that be, the judges, do you think they would have just made him wait a little bit longer before anointing him the next big thing in the IFBB? Um, yeah, I mean, then, you know, that's, it, it's, it's, like I said, it's a subjective sport. I mean, it happens. It's, you know, not, you have to knock out the champ. You have to, you know, you do have to pay your dues, but, uh, you know, when you show up the way Justin Compton showed up, you know, I, those, it's, it's almost like you cannot not reward him. I mean, Evan, you know, I think in 2011, when Evan did the, the Flex Pro, um, he, you know, he was, he was only three years into his bodybuilding career. And he beat Dexter Jackson at the at the flex at the flex throw in uh, 2011, early 2011. Um, so I mean, if you come in, yeah, th- yeah, there is there is there is a there is a sense of you know having to pay your dues and stuff. But bodybuilding is the easiest category, you know, out of all the categories we have in the MPC and IFBB. Because if you show up big, hard, and ripped, yeah, there's only so much denying that that they they could, you know, say that well he didn't deserve this placing. But if you show up the way Justin Thompson did at the Arnold, you know, he was I. I think he was the best bodybuilder on stage overall, except for that, that one body part. Yeah. Uh, before we uh, switch gears and talk more about just your approach as a coach and get into all that stuff, because I want to hit you with some some head-on questions, your style versus other coaches' style. What did you uh, – I actually saw you at the – I was at the Arnold – and it looked as though you were you were kind of in another direction. I was going another direction, but you were very focused. I had a feeling the two twelves had just gotten over with. Um, but that's not what I'm going to ask you about. What what was your just in general opinion of the expo? Are you a fan of the expo, or are you just see it as like a necessary evil because you're involved in the industry so heavily? Or what do you think about it? I mean, I, I think it's great for bodybuilding. I think you know, and I, I think I think it's just great for the sport overall. I mean, the way the way the sport has been growing is. You know, it's fantastic. Um, and everything I have in my life is because of the MPC and I could be everything. You know, um, everything, everything I have. You know, where I'm sitting at right now, you know, with the car I get in, I get in you know, when I go to my stores, everything is because of bodybuilding. And um, I think the growth of the sport and what, you know, what the sport has been able to do, you know, has impacted a lot of lives. And, um, I mean, I, you know, the expo is... It's great. My my personal, you know, me personally, I don't get to enjoy it because I'm running around all over the place. You know, um, I have 16 clients together, you know, with the pro and the amateur this weekend, uh, last weekend. Um, so it was kind of hard for me to enjoy the expo. Um, but as a fan, yeah, man, I used to walk around that expo and, you know, have like, Dirty bags, <laughs> shopping cart, <laughs> you know, collecting samples and trying to talk to everybody. And yeah, I mean, I love it, man. I think I think it's great. It's packed, you know, but I think it's great. It's so packed. It's hot and it's packed, and you can't yeah. find parking and that all. <laughs> well, Ohio, um, Ohio's not the okay. best place to have this at, but you know, it's already in Ohio. So where are they going to have it? You know, if they, if they need some place like they need something like where Siebel's held, which is a huge, huge, huge complex. You know. Right. No, I would agree with that. Uh, yeah, I, 
Uh, it's cheap. I imagine it's cheap, uh, you know, to, to hold it there. It's kind of like, why is the Olympia at the Orleans instead of one of the major casinos? I'm always sure there's financial uh, interest in mind with that. It makes sense. Um, so let, let's talk about I know one of the topics on the forum lately. Uh, it's it's not a new topic, but it's it's one that's buzzed up on um, has been kind of a conflict of interest. So, for example, you had Marco Rivera and uh, Aaron Clark both coaching them in the 212 uh, Arnold this past week. How hard is it for some of these coaches like yourself or Hani or George or Aceto, um to have multiple competitors in the same division all competing against each other? Is there any cattiness or, you know, bullshit that you guys have to deal with? Like, oh, he's treating them better than I am or. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you a perfect example. You know, the year uh, Justin Compton turned pro, I had first, second, and third in that class. I had Justin Compton, I had Lloyd Dalla, and I had Rob Jules. You know, um, all three of them eventually turned pro. Um, but yeah, and, and I mean, and that year I had twenty three people at that national show. You know, I think we took home uh, like five pro cards and like. Four second, uh, fourth, third place finish. It was a good year. Um, it's tough. So what I had to do was like I had to schedule like Justin like at five o'clock in the morning, and then I had to schedule like Lloyd Dollar like two or three clients after that, and I had to schedule Rob Buell two or three clients after that. You know, I couldn't have him back to back and come into the room. Um, even in, even in the light heavyweight division, I had a really good friend of mine, um, uh, Michael George from from Brooklyn, and uh, you know, and he was going up against Adam, who won the who won his pro card um, at that show. Um, one light heavyweight class, and uh, yeah, it's, it's 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 tough. But I don't I don't play favoritism, and my clients know I don't play favoritism, and it's also the reason why I don't work with my friends, um, my, my my close friends in New York City. You know, I've worked with everybody in New York City pretty much. I don't I don't currently work with them is because you know they expect a lot out of me as far as like um. Special treatment, you know. Uh, you know, I, I I run I run my prep business the way I run my prep business evenly with everybody. So if I treat somebody from Idaho a certain way, I have to treat somebody from New York a certain way. And uh, I got and that and that's the reason why I don't work with you know with my close friends in New York City. You know, there are top pros. I mean, we have some top pros in New York, and I've worked with all of them at one point. So how would you say like, um, cause I'm, I'm sure you guys all talk. It's, it's really not that big of a world, the IFBB uh, side of the sport. Um, is there anybody that when you're out to eat with somebody that is like the butt of the joke, like, is it, is it Chris Aceto or is it George Farah or is it Hani Rambod? Is there any coach that just or w- w- amongst you guys that just, you guys look back and say, why is that bodybuilder working with that guy? He doesn't know anything or is there anything like, is there any stuff like talking behind the scenes like that going on or not? Nah? There's a million, a million conversations like that going on. Um, none of, none of which of the ones you spoke about. Um, you know, oh, okay. if, if you look back, if you look back at the last ten years, you know who who were we talking about ten years ago? We were talking about Hani. We were talking about George. We were talking about Chad. We were talking about you know Cito. You know, Oscar's been in the picture with Kai and you know Oval Bird for years. You know, I mean, the top coaches really haven't changed over the last decade. You know. Um, there are some some coaches that have come up that are good coaches, and and it, they've you know again you know going back to paying their dues, they have paid their dues, and you know I think most importantly more than anything else, to, you know to be to, to to be branded a winner, you have to win, you have to win pro cards, and you have to win pro shows. You just can't you just can't win. You just can't say you know what I have two hundred fifty clients, you know it's enough to pay my mortgage, it's enough to pay my car note, and you know I'm a good coach. That's not a good coach. A good coach has to win. So. You can't like, I'm sure, you know, people, people talk bad about me. People talk bad about George. People talk bad about Hani, you know, and, and, and there's people that work with me that didn't do well with Hani. And there's people that work with Hani that didn't do well with me. You know, Justin is, you know, Justin right, is a good right. example. You know, Justin worked with me at the Junior Nationals and we did well. He went to work with Hani. He didn't do well. He came back to work with me. He, you know, he won, he won a pro card and now he's doing his own prep, you know, and, and it's, it's just, People work differently with different coaches, but the coaches you mentioned are all top coaches because they win. 
Taylor, do you want to touch on that or should I? Because that my 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 red alert is coming off right now. You go for um, it. Shoot, shoot, you, you, shoot. you sound excited, Matt. You're excited. <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited. No, this is just this is just this is like my favorite topic right now. Um, Justin, Justin and Hani, they they come off on their videos as though they're working together. Right. Justin has said that he's doing his own prep, but then Hani says he's doing Justin's prep. You just said Justin's doing his own prep it kind of sounds like honey's full of shit and no one and he's not really working with justin <laughs> what do you know any, do you know any back at backstories here or is is honey basically just endorsing justin as his evagen athlete or, or what's the real scoop yeah i mean justin signs evagen you know evagen is, is honey's honey's brand and and you know honey has to sell the brand and he does pay justin a good amount of money to be you know to be a star athlete um, I know Steve Kukul is just signed to uh, Omax. When I resigned from Omax, he's just signed with Omax. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure that Justin, you know, Justin's a very intelligent young man. You know, he, I think he's a, he has a degree in micro uh, mechanical engineering. You know, he's a very intelligent young man. You know, he, he, he knows a lot. He's very intelligent. He keeps a log of everything. You know, we've talked in the past, you know, about, you know, what we've done in the past. You know, he's... He could. He, he's one of the. He's one of the few that could do his own prep. But, 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 if Hani would have seen what was going on with Justin's body at the Arnold's, I'm sure that Hani would have fixed it because Hani is, you know, he's that good. Whether listen, whether whether you're working with Miss Olympia, who has genetics blessed by Zeus God and <laughs> whatever the Norse God is, you know, Phil Heath, or, and you, if you work with all these genetically blessed, you know. Bodybuilders, you still you're still a good coach because you have board people up. You know, a lot of a lot of coaches say, well, a lot of people say, well, you know what, these guys only work with the top top bodybuilders in the world that have these type of genetics. Yeah, it's easy. I mean, you know, my my, my grandmother could coach some of these some of these bodybuilders because it doesn't take that much knowledge. But at the end of the day, you know, these guys are knowledgeable and these guys would help. So Hani would have definitely. I I believe that Hani would have fixed that problem. Okay. Okay. I, I, I don't, but <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. Taylor and I were talking during the show and I said, Taylor, am I crazy? Or does Justin have a look to him that looks like Steve Kuklo? And as far as like his from the front, he kind of looked a little washed out. Like and no also real... what Phil had this year at the Olympia. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I, and, and then I just sit back and I say to myself, all right, Phil, really smart guy. Also, um, great genetics. How much is Hani really helping Phil? How much was Hani really helping Cutler? I don't really think he's helping anybody and they're all endorsed athletes. <laughs> no, he was. I mean, I mean, I, I, listen, I, I don't, like I said, I don't, I don't bullshit. I'm, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bodybuilder, but I'm not a cult follower. You know, I, I'm not, I, I, this is, this is, this is my business. I make money from the bodybuilding industry, and I love my sport to death. Like I said earlier, you know, I'm, I'm, everything I have is because of the NPC and IBB, but I'm not a cult follower. I don't, I don't sit around saying, well, there's myocytin glands from, I mean, myocytin <laughs> inhibitors from Pluto that are creating Rami and blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm not on that mindset. Um, but Hani does help Phil. He does, he's helped Phil a lot. I mean, me and Phil are really good friends, you know. Um, Hani did help Jay, you know, um, help because Jay is very knowledgeable. Jay was Mr. Olympia. You know, I mean, I think, I think the person who helped Jay the most was Chris Asino because he's the one who, you know, got him up there first. Um, but yeah, I mean, I need a good coach. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say he, he is otherwise. He's not paying me. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know, I can tell you he was a good coach. He's not a good coach. I wouldn't want to do it on the air. I, you know, if we were in person, I could do that. And I, I'm very fast to say that because, you know, I'm, I, if you guys see my, 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 my social media and all that, you know, I'm always the first one saying, you know, these are my hashtags, you know, winning this coach, team fact, 51 pro cards, blah, 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 blah. So I am, I am competitive, but you know, I, I, I have, I have to stand up and say that Hani is a good coach. I've decided that um, he, he doesn't get the nickname Procreator anymore. You do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might have him beat there in the numbers. I'd say. I think yeah. I do. I think I actually do, but he has, he has a lot more Olympians than I do right that's now. That's true. That's true. <laughs> for now. For now. Uh, it's going to be hard to catch up on that one. I'm not going to lie. Yeah make a little phone call justin compton a little bit i want to get into 
I know, I know. I think he's just back <laughs> on board, sure. man. I'm going to have to pay long. him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pay him. Man. <laughs> Let's let's roll into some. Tra- actually, there's one more thing because I I actually have heard this multiple times, and I know the answer, but I want to I want to hear you say it. Uh, factory move rack, interesting name. It's an interesting name. Now your your father's Muslim and your mother's Cuban. Is that right? Yeah, my father's Arabic. My mom is Cuban. Um, my parents divorced when I was five, so I was raised um, Catholic, and I consider myself more Spanish lion than anything else. Are you bilingual? Do you speak, obviously, Spanish fluently? I speak Spanish fluently. Well, I don't even speak English fluently, but <laughs> I speak Spanish. Um, <laughs> I have a deep voice. That's and I stutter, man. What do you want me to do? <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, Spanish, I'm pretty fluent. I don't, I don't, I don't write it too well. Um, Arabic, I kind of understand it a little bit if they're talking. Um, again, my parents divorced when I was five, so it's kind of hard to pick up the language. I tried to study it a couple of years ago. Um, after I read, after I got my master's degree, I was going to get a job, and um, and they 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 asked me about if you know for me to learn um, the Arabic language, and it was kind of hard, and it's just hard to pick up. I imagine so. Now, any plans on going down to Cuba now that uh, Mary? <laughs> I was thinking about it. Can get down there or not? I was. Uh, see, I was actually, see, I know. You know yeah, no, I was I was thinking about a business venture out in Cuba, which is kind of weird that you, you just mentioned it. But um, yeah, I would love to go out there and uh, and see where you know my my family's from. Absolutely, I know it's like a whole different world. It's like 1950s cars out there, and yeah, it's a little different. That'll be fun. Yeah, if you go, you'll have to you have to bring a you have to bring a film crew and uh, let us all see a bodybuilder down there. I know. I wonder. I wonder what the bodybuilders like out there look like, man. It's I, I can't like I had I just had a bodybuilder when the. Uh, the Independence Club in the Dominican Republic and when he got on stage he just blew everybody away because nobody had like the knowledge and, and they just they don't just they don't understand bodybuilding the way we do Iron Mag Labs is the creator of the most hardcore bodybuilding supplements on the market makers of the original formula Super DMZ and now Super DMZ 3.0 Iron Mag Labs brings you the strongest legal pro hormones on the market also available are Epitrin, Halo Extreme, Epistane, and Asta RX. Go to IronMagLabs.com right now and order from a wide selection. If you are a fan of Project Bodybuilding, please support this company. IronMagLabs.com, the most hardcore bodybuilding supplements on the market, period. Evolution Peptides is Project Bodybuilding's first and most loyal peptide and research source. Use their new discount code, PRO40, to save 40% off every order you make at checkout. Viagra, Cialis, Anti-Estrogens, CJC-1295 with DAC, Melatonin-2, GHRP-6, IGF-1, and several more for all of your researching needs. Visit evolutionpeptides.com and use the code PRO40 to redeem your 40% discount. One more time, that's evolutionpeptides.com. All right, so uh, in fact, uh, talk a little bit about your approach to working with a client. I know I've done some research on you, just talking to some guys you've worked with. Um, you insist on everybody getting blood work done, is that right? Not everybody. I mean, it, you know, it, it, not, not, not everybody can because it, it costs a lot of money and everybody has insurance, but I mean, it, it's it's always good to get it done for, you know, first and foremost for the health reason and, you know, you know, and then for the bodybuilding purposes, it's, you know, it shows a lot. It shows, you know, what, what would be lacking as far as testosterone, estrogen increase, you know. You know, problems with your IGF-1, G serum levels. You know, your thyroid, T3, T4, TSHs, um, and just a lot of, lot, a lot of things in general that you know it, it does show. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and when you're working with somebody new. Um, I, I imagine you're not the type of coach that works off of a template. Everybody gets their own special treatment. Uh, what is the hardest person to work with? Somebody that's brand new, never been coached before, or had several different prep coaches in the past. What's um, what, what's better for you? I should say. It, 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 it's all tough. Um, yesterday I had a client email me telling me, um, you know, um, he doesn't think it's working out. And I told him, well, I told you when you hired me that, you know, you did have a slow metabolism, you know, you, your, you know, your old coaches did destroy your metabolism, um, and it was going to take time to rebuild, you know, and I told him right off the bat, because what I do is, I, you know, I act, 
I asked them what they've done in the past, and you know, this kid has been pretty much in the prep for a whole year, literally a whole year, come April. Um, and 50 grams of carbs per day, you know, six days a week, you know, one refeed day, you know, uh, and nonstop, just nonstop usage of supplements. And, and I told him that, and when, you know, when he emailed me, it was about a month ago, and he said, I want to do a show. And I'm said, I told him, I said, listen, I said, you know, first of all, you're 200 pounds, you know, you're eating 50 grams of carbs right now, you're doing an hour and a half of cardio. There's no way you're gonna get down to a middleweight class. You know, and I'm not going to take out all your cars and give you three hours of cardio. So that's, you know, it, 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 I think it's it's harder to work with people that, that have been damaged in the past. Um, but you have to be honest with them and tell them, you know, it's going to take some time sometimes. And sometimes you get, the, you know, sometimes you get a client that, you know, and I get them a lot. I look at the pictures and I'm like, holy shit. And I write it right back. I'm like, you got crazy potential. You have crazy genetics. Let's see, you know, let's hope we could reach, you know, top five in national and fight for this pro card. Hey, I had a, just since you mentioned it, what do you think are the big uh, all, like things that are causing the sort of the damaged metabolism, and how do you? What are your first steps in trying to uh, repair it? Like, how do you reverse the process? Oh, well, I mean, low, you know, low, low amount of food is, is is a problem because just like high amount of carbs increases insulin, so does low, you know, so does low food. I mean, you know, once your once your insulin goes up and it stays there. And yet you're eating air, you know, <laughs> your body's not going to change, you know, and, and, and it's, it's more, it's more the female than anything else. Um, cause coaches just know how to work with people. You know, if, if less food is better, listen, if less food is better, more cardio or more drugs, everybody, everybody would be a pro bodybuilder or, or pro, or, you know, a pro yeah. in, in, in this thing. If it was that linear and simple, right? Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not that simple. Just hang out in the gym all day long and train five hours a day, do four hours of cardio, and you know, pump everything to your body, and that's it. You know, it's not that simple. Yeah, and uh, how? What's your first step? Is just dropping the cardio, raising the food, or the carbs, or how, how do you decide what to do first to sort of try to repair the other damage? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what you have to do. You have to, you know, you have to, you have to alleviate, you know, what other problems they had, which is mostly, you know, you have to increase the food, but you have to tell them, especially the females, you have to be honest with them. You have to tell them, listen, we're going to have to increase this food, you know, even if we carb cycle it, you know, we have to take out a lot of, a lot of these girls are on stimulants, a lot of these girls are like on fat burners for a long time, so all that stuff has to be taken out, and you have to repair the body, and, you know, again, some genetics, some genes repair faster than others, and, you know, they 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 get to, to be repaired. But if you guys know this, there's, there's a lot of bikini girls that fall off the map. And the reason why they fall off the map is because their bodies get destroyed. And after a while, they're gone. That's it. They're not going to be repaired. Yeah, they usually are the ones who, you know, they get into working out, do a show, and they think it's this great thing. They don't realize how hard and demanding it is. And then it traumatizes them, and then they shit talk it for the rest of their life, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, actually, when that happens, I shoot off my rifle and the bugle plays when another bikini competitor <laughs> <laughs> goes down. <laughs> yeah, and then they, they make a Facebook post about now how they're going to live for balance and all, you know, balance. <laughs> Did you just nail that on the head or what? <laughs> <laughs> We've all seen it. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, oh, hold on. So it's, though, man. Yeah, I agree. So, so fact, what's, uh, what's more rewarding, though? Like, as a coach, would you rather have somebody that's like, a real challenge and then you see it as a challenge to get them in great shape or is it more rewarding where everything you throw at them just <laughs> works and you kind of feel like a genius for five minutes <laughs> and I, I don't have enough brain power to feel like a genius um, I, I put in so much work man is uh, I, I'm not, I, honestly, I'm never content, you know, and I was asked this question the other day about, you know, what makes me happy in bodybuilding and being, being in bodybuilding makes me happy, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm the type of person that until you get, you know, until you win, I'm nervous, man, like, and I, I'm, I'm even more nervous, like, once you're in the back room because then I really have control of nothing. The judges have control of everything in their hands. So, um, yeah, I mean, I love when a prep comes together. I, I love to have a bikini girl eat 300 grams of carbs a week before the show. You know, I love to have a, a bodybuilder carb deplete down to 500 grams of carbs. You know, 400 grams of carbs, that'd be his carb depletion. That'd be great, but it just doesn't always happen that way. Is there anything you wouldn't do as far as your dieting with an athlete? Like, would you just, is there anything like just as off limits, be it keto or something drastic? 
Well, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in keto because nobody on that Olympia or Arnold stage does keto. So here's my here's my thought of all these new ideas that are coming out. You know, if none of the top athletes in the world, well, none, none of the top competitors, or let's focus on bodybuilders, none of the top bodybuilders in the world do it, then it doesn't work. You know, whether it's keto, whether it's macros, whether it's this and whether it's that, you know, these guys are not doing that. You know, so. No, I don't. I don't do stuff like that. But it is. It is valuable to put in there as a shock. Sometimes, like you know, sometimes like you know, not too much with the guys or with the girls. Like I'll do a carb cycle, um, and then I'll do a week of keto, and then I'll bump up the food, and then I'll go back to like a carb cycle. So again, we're going up and down with the metabolism. We're not. We're not keeping the metabolism going, you know, downward in the spiral to the point of like negative carbs because you cannot have negative carbs, and that's the problem. I told you, Taylor, you can't do negative carbs. <laughs> when the hell did I ever say you could do <laughs> you're, you're like double, double, double boiling the, 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 the oatmeal to try to get all the carbs out of it or something, man. <laughs> Well, let's uh, let's um, okay. So more about the uh, you just your clientele in general, because um, I know there's a lot of people that are like you know you have people that compete, you have people long distance all over the world, all over the country. Um, do you ever set aside a time where you don't take emails, calls, text messages, or is it literally because you know you're working on like 24 different time zones? I imagine you know that's at some point you, you got to tell these people enough's enough, right? The only the only that don't work. Um, I can't say I don't work. The only, the only day I don't do diets is Sundays because Sundays, you know, we go to church and after church we have, um, you know, we do, we do teenage counseling, um, retreats now that it's going to get, you know, nice outside. So that's, that's the only day, like, I, I won't do a diet. Um, my clients know that. But other than that, you know, six days a week, 24 hours a day, whenever the, 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 the emails come in, I'm doing them. I mean, sometimes I, I, can't, I can't get to the emails until nighttime. Um, but I mean, I work like this morning. I went to sleep at eight o'clock in the morning. So I mean, I, I work. You know, I, I work eighteen hours a day, guys. I work eighteen hours a day, six days a week, and it's been like this since I started prepping people in two thousand eight. Are you married or no? Um, I, I <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm I'm separated right now. You know, um, you know, that's where I'm at right now. Is, I, I don't want to get into a touchy subject, but is, is, was it because you're working 24-7? Is that no. part of it? Or? No, no, no okay. absolutely not. No, no. It was just a matter of, uh, no, I mean, we were, I had to. I had to. In, in 2008, um, I was homeless. You know, um, I've been homeless a couple of times, you know, especially as a child. I've, you know, I've, I've seen my mother cry from hunger. You know, so I've, I, the reason why I work is because I'm scared. The reason why I don't go back to bodybuilding is because I'm scared. I'm scared of waking up tomorrow and having nothing. And in 2008, you know, we literally were getting kicked out of the house, out of the apartment by the marshals. You know, they repossessed the cars. You know, I had no money, and um, I was two days away from being completely homeless. And uh, and I got my first um, client on MySpace, <clears throat> and um, he asked me about prep people. And I said, yeah, I mean, I've helped people in the past. And he goes, well, what would you charge? I'm like, well, I don't really charge anybody, but here's my price. And um, that was it. And I started building a clientele from 2008. But, I mean, I've been prepping people. I remember the first person I prepped was my friend's dad. I must have been, like, 17 years old, and he was competing in in, um, in, a, in a show in Upstate in White Plains, and I helped him get ready for the show. And I was, I was I think, 16, 17. Um, but, I mean, my knowledge from bodybuilding comes from – when I was very young, I didn't like bodybuilding. I couldn't stand bodybuilding. I hated it. You know, I hated it until I was like 26. I mean, I worked out and I powerlifted, and I would go and squat 600 pounds and eat a pie of pizza and bring, bring something called bulk salt that had like 200 grams of sugar in there. You know, all I cared about was getting bigger and stronger. But when I went, to, I went to my first bodybuilding show in New York in 2000, and I was helping my friend uh, get ready for the show, and I went backstage, and I'm like, I could do this. And I sat down, and the audience was like, I'm gonna become a pro. And everybody laughed at me. They were like, you hate bodybuilding. I'm like, no, I'm going to be a pro. I'm going to be a pro. You see? And I turned mm-hmm. pro in four shows. Was there, well, was I didn't realize really that was that a it was that instant uh, that you you didn't, you were like, uh, you hated it. And then you saw a show and just, it just 180, one, absolutely. No, not that I hated it. I just, I didn't like bodybuilders. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> not that, I didn't like the sport. I just didn't like bodybuilders. I didn't like the way they acted. I didn't like the cockiness. I didn't like, I didn't like bodybuilders. Um, but I trained. I mean, I, I was 200. I was 200 solid pounds. I was probably like 7% body fat, 6% body fat at 5'5". Five, five, and, and that was in 2000. 
literally, you know, nothing. I was 100% natural, and, you know, I, I was really, you know, I was just training. I, tra I trained until, like, 26 and a half that way. And um, I went to, and, and I, I, I was a stockbroker at the time. And uh, I was, you know, I, was, I wasn't happy being a stockbroker, and I said, I'm going to do something else. And I started doing something else, and guys were starting to train, and started bodybuilding, and I knew I was going to be a pro because I knew what I looked like at that point with everybody on stage, you know, looking the way they did, and I could beat most of these guys, and I had good genetics. And I knew I had good genetics because, like I said, I've been around the sport for a long time. Do you still hate bodybuilders? <laughs> no. <laughs> I hate cocky people. <laughs> no, you know what? No, not cocky. Cock, cocky's not a bad thing. Cocky cocky means confidence. So when you say, when you, you know, cocky, uh, the word cocky has the word cocky in it, so it's it's considered, it's thought of as a bad word. I don't like arrogant people. Arrogant people are the ones I don't like. And that's not just in bodybuilding, it's in every phase of life. I guess the, the main difference is be, uh, you know, being sort of cocky or whatever is thinking you're good and arrogance thinking you're better than other people because you're good, right? Right, right, yeah. right, right. That's a good definition, Taylor. I like that. You're, you're welcome. You yeah. can keep it, right? Yeah. I will. I'm going to put that in the uh, memory <laughs> bank. That was good. I didn't know we were talking to the Wolf of Wall Street here with us, actually. I got some tricks. I got some tricks up my sleeve. I'm just trying to figure out he, if he's a stockbroker, how he's finding suits to fit a five foot five, two hundred fifty pound guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean it was even even at two hundred pounds. I mean it wasn't that bad. When I just I got up to two eighty eventually. I know. So I was walking around at five five two eighty at one point. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I, was, I was just a good stockbroker. I, I, I did life health insurance for, for Presidential, and then I became a stockbroker. You know, I made good money. I made 100000 my first two years, you know, each year, but it just was, it wasn't the life I wanted to live. So you, I think, I, think, I think fear is a great motivator for a lot of people, and uh, uh, just to do well and, you know, work your ass off and everything else, like you're saying. Um, do you still have, you know, I, I believe that you do, still have that fear of going back to where you were. Now, does that translate to your your bodybuilding life now like are you still probably going after like cheaper cuts of meat or always no. looking for the disc so you're okay you got it okay so you're eating some organic food every now and then or uh yeah, no, I, 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 I travel first class and I think good hotels <laughs> there we go okay okay that, that's, that's no, good. No, I'm just kidding I don't know my, no, my fear is it's not it's not listen it's not, it's not buying a pair of Jordans it's not you know going to a good restaurant my fear is bottom of what poverty is, you know, poverty, poverty level in this country has a certain amount of money. I believe it was like 20,000 or 22,000. I mean, I had no money. I had no income, no money, no nothing. You know, I had the marshals literally come to my house and lock the doors and say, you know, within two days, if you can't come up with the rent, you know, you can't no longer live here anymore. At that time, <clears throat> my dad, uh, my stepdad had the first, was going through his first bout of cancer. And uh, it was a lot of stuff, the reason why they keep, keep competing. Um, a lot of stuff, you know. Cause I, I would have been a good bodybuilder. I would have won pro shows. I would never won an Arnold's. I would never won an Olympia. I'm very, I'm very, I, I know that for a fact. Um, but I would, I would have won shows. I would have been a good bodybuilder. Just things didn't happen in, in the right place at the right time. So five foot five, two hundred eighty pounds at your biggest, um, <clears throat> and you have sleep apnea. Is that right? Yeah, I do have sleep apnea. Matter of fact, I have to go change my machine now. <laughs> Good thing to remind you, this show's a lifesaver. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they peak. But I mean, in 2000, in 2010, I was, that's when I got up to 280 and I started dieting down. And um, I had put some pictures up of around like 265. And I was pretty, I was pretty in really good condition. I would have, I would have done that sex show that we just talked about, the one Evan won. Um, and I think I would have done well on that show, you know what I mean? I would have, I think I would have been top five in that show, and I could have came back to bodybuilding. But we opened up our first store, and you know, priorities, business, and family always comes first. And right now, my first priority is still my clients, and then after that is business. Any any chances we're gonna ever see you on a pro stage again? I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> this is a touchy subject. Um, I can't. This is what I love doing. I, I love being a bodybuilder. You know, people ask me what I do for a living. I tell them I'm a pro bodybuilder. I don't tell them I, I do this or I do this or I do that. You know, that always comes second to what I to what I do. Um, I, when I'm on a plane, you know, people start a conversation. So what do you do for a living? I'm a pro bodybuilder. You know, I love being a pro bodybuilder. I love being a bodybuilder. I, this is this, it's, it's everything I've always wanted to be in my heart. You know, my biggest my biggest 
regret is never going to be on the Olympia stage. And that will be the biggest regret I've ever, I ever had in my whole entire life, no matter where, what status I reach in life, whether it's, you know, Bill Gates status, whether it's Puffy Death status, whether, whatever status it is, my biggest regret is never to be on the Olympia stage. So that's how much love I have for the sport. So you didn't answer the question. <laughs> Okay, now to answer your question, um, I can't. No, I can't say. I can't say I'm not retired. I can't say I'm, okay. not, I'm never gonna get on stage. I do get into pretty good shape sometimes. I do like do like a two months, you know, transformation. I know I can still kick ass, man. Like I, I know I can still. I know I, I still can. But to to go back on stage and not be able to compete against the top guys doesn't make sense to me because. I would have to shut everything down. I just, I can't do it. I can't, you know, I can't say I would have been top five at the Arnold this year, you know, in that open class. I can't say that because I'm not. Oh, why, have, you ever thought, have you ever thought about doing, being very strategic the way like Dexter Jackson is and doing, you know, like some obscure pro show, like the San Jose pro, um, and, and nobody good is in the lineup. And then you just take an easy win and take that win and go on to the two twelve or excuse me, the, um, the Olympia and do it that way. Like, you don't have to win the New York Pro to go to the Olympia. And get my ass whipped at the Olympia? Why not? Sure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get to wear the warm-up suit, and it'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask me questions at the press conference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll be there for a while. No, I can't. It'll be hard to turn back the clock. It'll be very hard to turn back the clock. I'm honest. I'm honest. How old are you? I don't know if we got that out of you. I'm gonna be forty two. You got plenty. Of, you got plenty of years in the tank or gas in the tank too. I do because I haven't abused my body and I started late. Yeah, and that's yeah. the reason why I can make make the changes I still make nowadays. But it's, it's I'm not. I, I cannot sit here and discredit what these guys do and how these guys look like and say, yeah, well, look at my pictures. And if I was doing this nowadays, I can't. I can't do that. These guys are fantastic. These guys are some of the best athletes in the whole world. Is is that why you're holding on to the body weight though? Because I mean, if you're not gonna ever get on stage again, <laughs> I can't lose it, man. I can't, I can't, I can't get down under like two forty. There's no way. There's no way. I, it's just like for me to get down under two forty. I, 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 if I train, listen, if I train and I eat five, six meals a day, and I train three days a week, three, four days a week, I'm still keeping two forty five, two fifty. So. If if I did bodybuild 100 percent and do everything I had to do as a bodybuilder, there's no way I could get down to 212. It would be impossible. I got the secret for you. Go What's to Sia. Okay, here's the. I need mean, get out a piece of paper and a pen. Write this down, Taylor. Okay. You can write this down too. Okay. Give these these are for everybody <laughs> that needs to lose a lot of weight. Here's what you do. Okay. <laughs> you, you go. You go to Sia in New York and you hang out with Dave Palumbo. <laughs> <laughs> He is the only guy that's able to, able to go from 310 pounds to 190. <laughs> yeah, but they, that's, it took Dave a long time, though, man. It took Dave a long time to get down to that weight. He did. He absolutely did. Uh, Taylor, you got any uh, further questions before we hit the 10? I know you always have some uh, leftovers that we forget here. Yeah, yeah the scraps. Um, <laughs> I had. I was curious, you know, the, the latest fad, especially with social media, you see all these people, uh, a lot of coaches post stuff about their clients and how easy kind of the prep is they're bragging about doing low to no cardio bragging about high calories high carbs more cheap you know this guy's eating three cheap meals a week blah 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 um first off do you think that this is true and that like the that that's part of the reason people aren't showing up in shape these days 100 percent. yeah they're all trying to do the least 100 percent yeah. Um, yeah. Do you also think, do you think a lot of these coaches sort of uh, cherry pick which athletes they, they showcase to because they probably had a lot of other guys that they, uh, they can't get away with that stuff? Of course. But even, even the guy that, even the guy that is to showcase, how good are those guys? Yeah, that's true. You know, how good is, how good is somebody who's not doing cardio and is eating, you know, a flexible diet and, you know, it's eating, you know, cheating throughout the week and it's not, and it's not uh, sacrificing himself and, you know, Nah, I mean, look, look at the bodybuilders of the '90s again. Look at their faces; they're all sunken in. You know, even look at look at Dennis Wolf's face or, yeah. or Phil's face or Kai's face. These guys are all sunken in. You, you have, you have. There's no way to get in shape like that without without battling, you know, yourself to, to get into shape. Yeah, it seems like coaches sort of used to just brag about results, and now they're bragging about the easiest path there. Um, when did, you know why? Because they have to. They need clients. So of course, if you're telling the client I get you in shape and you don't have to sacrifice anything. The clients will say, yeah, because people don't want to work hard. People don't want to sacrifice. People don't want to put in the work. And again, that's in every aspect of life. But 
And this this sport is a very hard sport. So if I'm telling you to get you in shape without doing cardio, without doing this, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna take your money. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna put your money in my pocket, and I'm gonna steal your money because that's what they're doing. But how good are these athletes that they are showcasing that aren't doing cardio? They're good. They look good, but genetically they look good. Ah, okay, for example, uh, Lionel Bina- Bayaki. How good is his genetics? He, he's Great. Good. Yeah. But do we know that he cheats? Hell yeah. I would you know, do we know that he doesn't do that? He doesn't do cardio? Hell yeah. And that's the reason why he doesn't win. Yeah, absolutely. Does he have the genetics that are good enough to actually be in that top three, four, or five if he knew how to diet? Yeah, of course he has. But I mean I know I know I know I know the coaches that he has worked with very closely and I I know that, you know, he doesn't put in the work, you know, and mm. I, that's obvious. Because when listen, when you, when you look at a bodybuilder, you look at genetics, which is the outside of their bodies, and then you have to factor in the genes. The genes are the inside of the body. So the outside of the body could look good, small mu- small bones, big muscle bellies, but if the, if your genes don't work, then you're not gonna make the changes. But when you have been in some type of shape in the past and you can't get into shape now, you know, on top of people talking shit that you know you're not you're not dieting and doing cardio and stuff like that, then you have a problem. But when you put the genes and the, and the genetics together, that's when you have Daxter, Flex Wheeler, Ronnie Coleman, Phil Heath, you know, that's when you have these guys that are Marvel, you know, genetically gifted by God. But it, it takes both genetics and genes. Like like Dorian Yates didn't have great genetics. He had great genes. You know, the inside of his body worked very well. Very interesting. I agree. Do you think? Hold on. Do you think? Um, do you think Lionel Baiki like does this? Does this resonate with him? Like he keeps going back to these shows and placing. I'm seventh, curious 15th. why he keeps competing in the first place. Right. Right. Well, what What else does he have going on? Oh. A chili cook Eating? contest? I don't know. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's the truth. I mean, what, what, what else? I mean, you, you know, you love being a bodybuilder. You love having the attention. You love, you know, you love being looked at. You love being, you know, stared at when you're walking down the street. And sometimes that that's enough for you. And unfortunately, that doesn't translate to being a great bodybuilder when you're on stage. Like, people talk a lot about Phil, that Phil's genetically blessed and Phil's this, Phil's that, but... Phil's one of the hardest working bodybuilders that I know. I mean, for a fact, you know. I mean, and he has he has that champion mindset because he is he's a real you know he's a real a real athlete. He's you know Division One basketball player. Always played always played sports his entire life, and that's his advantage. You know, he had that killer instinct. A lot of people don't. A lot of these bodybuilders don't have that killer instinct. They rely on genetics. A lot of them don't. I didn't have great genetics. I had good genetics, but I would die, die not to get on shape, not to get on stage on stage on shape. I have actually. While you mentioned Phil Heath, I'm just a little curious if uh, you said you're you're pretty you're pretty close with him. Um, last year, even the people that are you know his biggest supporters kind of sort of questioned you know he wasn't in his best shape. He, you know he launched his new supplement line, all that shit. Do you have any inside uh, information that maybe he's taking this year a bit more aggressively, the uh, different approach to sort of uh, correct that? Um, I mean, was he at his best last year? No, but. <sighs> If, if you still break down the picture between him and Kai, and you you know you break down body part by body part, you know you will see why why Phil. Oh no, I had Phil kicking Kai's ass. I just think both yeah. of them weren't quite at their best. I think you know Phil didn't bring his best his best look. He still deserved to win. I was just uh, curious if you had any insight on that. Yeah, I mean he had a lot of stuff going on. I mean, I, yeah, you know, we missed Olympia. Have your own business and you know traveling and stuff like that. Like I know he's in Australia now. We just in Ohio last week, so he has a lot of stuff going on. But it's hard, man. It's not it's not easy to peak every time you get on stage. You know? And, and that's what happened, like even with Aaron, they were like, yo, what happened with Aaron? Why wasn't he in shape? Why wasn't it? Why wasn't that? I'm like, it's not that it's not that hard it's not that easy to peak every time somebody gets on stage. If it was, then we would all be great coaches. Yeah, absolutely. Are you surprised that Phil um there, he's pretty split down the middle of you either love him or you hate him. Are you surprised by that? Because I know you could say that, you could say he's the champion and everybody wants to hate on the champion, but I haven't seen Flex Lewis take the amount of shit that he, you know, that Phil takes. So, what do you think about that? Phil's very vocal. Um, Phil's very outspoken. Um, Phil, you know, Phil, Phil, you know, Phil, Phil before he was, you know, Mr. Olympia. Um, yeah, you know, he feels cocky. You know, there's no doubt about it, but he is a champion, and, you know, cocky being confident, and they have to, you know, they have to beat him. But 
Every, 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 every champion has a personality. You know, Ronnie Coleman was very outspoken. Ron, Ronnie Coleman was very cocky too, but he was very comical. So people enjoyed him. I don't think he was comical on purpose, but. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 neither do I. I mean, that's probably just his personality, you know? I mean, and Jay Cutler was a very serious, you know, very, you know, uh, very professional uh, Mr. Olympia, and that was his personality. And so the day, Jay, when you, say, when you see Jay going to the show, he's, he's the first person at the booth, and he's the last person to leave the booth. And, and that's, that's just how he is, you know? And that's, Phil just has his personality, and that's just, that's just who he is, you know? But I think he's, a, he's by far the best bodybuilder in the world now, and I don't, I don't see anybody beating him for a couple of years. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, Taylor, we gotta hit. Uh, we gotta hit back up with the ten questions. So, in Uh-oh. inside bodybuilding tradition, cue the music. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. We got 10 questions. Answer these however you like. Um, question number one. Whose physique would you rather spend a lifetime with? Sadiq, Hadzibek, or Big Rami? If you, could choose their, if you could choose their physique, you'd pick who? I'm, I'm a bodybuilder by, by nature, so for Rami. Rami it is. Sorry, okay. Sadiq, I love you, man. You're my buddy, and I'll probably see you tonight at best, but it's Rami. <laughs> <laughs> Question number two. What's more ridiculous? Branch Warren falling off the horse during the filming of Generation Iron or, or Roly Winkler crashing his motorcycle and missing last year's Arnold Classic? Uh, re- realistic, I think, is Branch because Branch would have pulled up a stunt like that. So I think that's more funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question number three. Does fish really thin the skin? Uh, man, I'm old school, man. Of course I'm going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, question number four. Arnold Schwarzenegger wants fans to write into Jim Mannion to change how the IFB, IFBB judges shows. Do you think anything will come of that? No. And the reason is, Every old champion thinks their time was the best and they're the best. And things change and things evolved. And you're always going to have that from anybody from any different generation. Yeah, that's true. Every dad tells their kid how hard the hike, you know, the hike to school uphill was in the snow and all that stuff. So. Yeah, I used, to, I used to walk to school barefooted uphill every day, you know. Over hot <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Question number five. On an average day, how many Facebook messages do you get from men asking for gay for pay? Average day, not many, but average month, probably a few. <laughs> Bad enough, I guess. Have there been yeah. any that you've taken seriously? <laughs> I, you know, you, the last time somebody gave me a dollar, I was 11 years old. I've, I've worked for my money and my whole entire life, so. I don't I, I, I can't even answer that question because I don't even understand how people do it. Yeah, it's not it's not the uh, pride of the industry, that's for sure. Taylor, what? I don't know how you do it, but hey, uh, well, shit, I got mouths to feed. You have to live for the rest of your life, you know, just to to help your bodybuilder or something, man. Are you crazy, man? That's not even like respect for yourself. Yeah, that's right, sorry, guys. But how do you true. burn those images and uh, that experience out of your brain? I guess. I don't know. How do you what? I'm just wondering how those guys, like you said, they have to live with it forever. They can't burn that shit out of their brain. The money's not going to last very long, but uh, the the uh, oh. The experience will get a job, man. Go sell drugs. Do something, man. You know that's the truth. Do porn. You know real porn. Yeah, huh? not grapefruit porn. Real porn. <laughs> yeah, do real porn. Do something. You know, get a real job. Uh, sell drugs. You know, have some type of you know, even if it's something illegal, man. Have the integrity in yourself to respect yourself. Amen. That's just the way I was brought up. <laughs> God, that was amazing. Question number six. Yeah. After after twenty five years in the gym. What's your least favorite thing about training, and what is your most favorite thing about training? I love everything about training. Everything. It's it's it's, it's euphoric. It's just <laughs> I just no matter what goes on in my mind, I get to that gym and everything's gone. That hour, hour and a half is like everything's gone. I still love it to this very day, man. It's just it's it's hard to get to the gym now, but I love everything about training. I love everything about being a bodybuilder. That's the honest truth. And nothing turns you off. That's good. No, no, not in the gym. I just love the gym. Question number seven. Should fans' opinions matter in determining a major bodybuilding champion like the Arnold or Olympia? (sighs) Tough question. 
you have judges. And anytime you have judges, you have a panel that's given the right to determine the outcome of a show. So it's hard. I mean, you can't, you know, if it was like American Idol, that you could call in the votes or, or, or one of those shows, like, you could press a button in the audience and it would be a different thing, but it's, it's just tough. You have judging. All so, right. I think that's a no, or it's tough. Um, question number eight. If left on a deserted island with no food, who do you eat first? Bob Chick, Lonnie Teeper, or Dan Solomon? Who do I eat first? Yeah, you got to eat one of them. <laughs> where, when am I getting? When, when am I getting rescued? You don't get rescued. You just got to. You're gonna. Oh, you're they're, gonna all, get... they're all going down, man. <laughs> Who's first though? <laughs> Who's first? Probably the smallest one because you deteriorate faster. Oh. <laughs> Now you're thinking, you're thinking, man. Probably be Lonnie. Yeah, you got to think, man. You got to be strategic. <laughs> Bob Chick's going to last a while, you know. He's still got the blood flow. Bob Chick's going to last long. He'll be, it'll be a harder fight, too, to get down, man, because he still got some size on him. <laughs> sorry, yo, sorry, Lonnie. Sorry. Oh, I told you this whole entire weekend. I love you to death, man, but you're the first one I got to go. <laughs> question, question number nine, and I promise these are only getting better. Question number nine. If you were hired for a guest posing and the only music they had to offer was Britney Spears, was Britney Spears, Hit Me Baby One More Time, or Christina Aguilera, I'm a Genie in a Bottle, which song do you go with? Uh, I'm trying to think of the posing routine right now. Um, Genie, <laughs> uh, come out with some Arabic music. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, according to my sensitivity, I would have to do the belly dance with Genie in the bottle. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta keep listening to the show and see if you ask these questions to other people. <laughs> we really do, and that's the best No, part. I know I have. I, I, I listened to the past episodes. I was expecting something like this. <laughs> <laughs> and your last question of the show. <clears throat> if Phil Heath competed in any other modern bodybuilding generation... Does he own any Sandows? Uh, every year, except the run. Oh, well, shit, 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 shit. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say every year, except the Ronnie Coleman's ring. Okay, wow. Sorry, Dorian. Could, Dorian's my favorite bodybuilder of all time, but. You think he would have even taken out uh, Lee Haney at his peak? Lee, the way Lee Haney looked back then against the way Phil he looks like now? Yeah. Yes. You put Lee Haney genetics into today's time, science, and knowledge, then we never know. Yeah, sure. You think, you think, uh, I've been having this. And, and, go ahead, go ahead, man. I was just going to say, I've been having this just thought in my head, and I've shared it with a few people about Lee Haney. Do you think he got out at the age of 31 after eight titles? Uh, because he kind of saw the writing on the wall and didn't yeah. and didn't want to go that way of Dorian and Nasser and uh, Ronnie. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. He saw he he saw Dorian coming and uh, and he, and he he didn't he didn't want to go that way. So that, that that tells you that tells you exactly you know what Lee Haney was doing back then, which wasn't probably much. And when he saw what everybody else was doing coming up, he said, you know what? He goes, I don't want to be a part of this. The guy retired at thirty one, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's insane. Crazy. Insane. Amazing. Um, well, Fac, um, let's give you a chance to plug yourself, any of your businesses, obviously, how fans can uh, get in touch with you for just to shout you out and to maybe become a you know, prospective client. Um, so go ahead and do all that, that fun stuff. Well, first, I want to thank you guys. I mean, this is probably the most fun I've had on a, on a radio show since, you know, I, I started bodybuilding. So I want to thank both you guys. And we thank you um, very much. Yes, yeah, thank you. Show. Um, uh, of course, I got my stores, NXT Sports Nutrition in Queens, New York. Um, I have two stores, one in Forest Hills and one in, uh, on Steinway Street. And I'm coming out with my own supplement line. It's called Factrician. We should be out in about four or five weeks. Uh, we have the national distribution already, so everybody should be able to get their hands on it. Um, as far as myself and the coaching, um, I still got my old school address. It's factpro, F-A-K-P-R-O, at AOL.com. Um, you know, and that's it. I mean, again, you know, thank you guys. And I had a lot of fun, man. It was, it was, it was a cool hour, man. <laughs> we, we appreciate it. Our uh, that's what we want to hear, right? Well, thank you, Fact. We'll let you go. And... Um, 
you can catch this interview in April. And uh, until, when we come back from break, we'll have another guest on. Factory Mubrak, thank you. Thank you, guys. God bless. Have a good day. Bye bye. Century of lonely nights, waiting for someone to release me. 